The book of Acts in the Bible, uh, in some churches across America, I think is rather neglected. 28 chapters in the book of Acts, but as I've said already, that there is no formal closure to this book. It just, it just, and I've read it to you in the 28th chapter, it just carries on into the day and age in which you and I are today. The living, breathing church. And the book of Acts is not only what Jesus began to do back then, but what he is still doing today. The reality is that what he did in the book of Acts, we're not seeing as much today. Uh, I didn't have a screen made, but if I did, it would be, it's time to go upstream. That's what it would say. If you want a title for the message, that's what it's called. Let's go upstream. God is not absent from this world. He's very much as present as he was 2,000 years ago. God is as present today as he was when he healed the blind eyes of Bartimaeus. God is every bit as much here today as he raised up the, the, the man on the, on the, on the, by the pool of Bethesda. God is very much here today as he was back when they lowered the man down through the roof and he was healed by the power of God. He's not absent from this world today. He is as much today here as he was back then. In fact, the Bible says, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. So God has not left his church he has not abdicated his throne he has not left the body of believers here he is with us but i want to tell you this morning that the book of acts doesn't just talk about a god uh, uh, like an entity that is like like you know many others may worship other gods in this world it talks about a god who's a god of the supernatural who's a god of signs and wonders and miracles and the bible tells us how important it is that we understand that we have not been left in america or anywhere in the world today without the opportunity for a supernatural god to move in the realm of his church and when devils are attacking and demonic activity is rampant and sickness and disease are filling our hospitals and plaguing people's lives i want you to know this morning that there's still a god in america that there's still a mighty god there's still a god who opens blind eyes and heals deaf ears and lame legs walk again hallelujah because it would be very easy for us to begin to believe that in the absence of the miraculous and in the absence of the supernatural that maybe god has backed off but I want you to get it in your heart today. God has never backed off. God has never pulled himself away from his people. Come on, church. God has never failed to be ready. God is the proverbial Boy Scout. He's always ready. He's ready to do anything that he promised he would do. Uh, the church, though, is the only entity that could move away from God. And when we do, then we, we, we suffer the consequences thereof. So the church is you and I. That's why the book of Acts is so amazing. But it's not just a gathering of the relic saints. It's not just a gathering of the historical nostalgic few. The church is not just a gathering of, the, of, the, of those that are ecumenical, you know, uh, boys club gathering. It's more than that this morning. The church is a mighty people that were pulled out of sin and brought into righteousness, holiness, and godliness. And when church becomes religious or a gathering like a club on a Saturday night, then we become religious and we will never see the manifested power of God. I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of things I could be doing. I've got better things to do than sit in some mausoleum of the saints. I've got better things to do with my time than sit in some club type religious gathering. Are you here this morning? I've got better things to do with my time than just come together for a religious experience with God. I want you to understand today that the book of Acts is the outpouring 
outpouring of the Holy Ghost. It is God moving in and amongst his people. It is the church coming alive. It is God confirming his word with signs and wonders and miracles. Give the Lord a hand to pray. Contrary to what others might say, we have a right to embrace those things that are spoken in the book of Acts. Can we not put a button on that keyboard that when you hit it, it'll shout, Amen? Contrary to what some might think, we have a right to embrace the promise of God. Hallelujah. The things that have been lost in the supernatural realm in these next days and weeks and months, God is restoring. That's the promise of God. He said, I will restore that which the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust has eaten away. What did those varmints eat what did they do they ate away at the foundation of God's house they ate away at the power of our pulpits they ate away church at the demonstrated manifestation of the miracle power of God but you can sit there and look at me this morning and wonder what I'm talking about but I'm talking about a God who still sets the captive free I'm talking about a God that it'll still deliver a drug addict. I'm talking about a God this morning that if we'll get back into the book of Acts, we will see signs, wonders, and miracles by the power of God. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, you don't need to turn there, but the Bible says this, the second chapter, which is the chapter that speaks of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. And God said, but this is that. This is what? This, what happened in the upper room. This that was spoken of in Acts chapter 1, that you shall receive power. Everybody shall power. Power is dunamis. Power is dynamite. Power is an expression. When you explode a stick of dynamite, everybody hears it. Everybody knows something's going on. But where is the power in the church? Where are those that are lost perking their ears up and saying, did you hear that? But God says this is that. He says in the last days, not singular day because God was not just referring through the prophet of old a one-time experience if he would have said that he would have said in the last day there will come an encounter in a room in Jerusalem on the third level where once 500 people stood but weaned down to 120 who were desperate for God. He said it in the last day, not day, but days, plural. In other words, he said there won't just be one outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but there will be multiple outpourings. Come on, somebody. He said you'll see it in the book of Acts chapter 2, but you'll see it in 2021 in Great Life Church. You'll see it in other churches that aren't afraid to preach the gospel, that aren't afraid to call sin sin and holiness holiness and raise the standard of godly living so God can manifest in our midst the supernatural power of God so he said in the last days he said verse 16 but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel and it shall come to pass that in the last days saith God I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters, your sons and your daughters, your sons and your daughters. I told our staff the other day, I said, we're not raising up a people. We're not raising up a youth group. We're not raising up Pastor Brandon young adults. 
We're not raising up little babies and children and preschoolers in our ministries that are going to learn how to barely get by, survive another day, hope to one day scrape it into heaven by the skin of their teeth. We're not raising up that kind of people. I'm talking about your children this morning. I'm talking about your grandbabies this morning. Come on. I'm talking about those that you have given birth to, that your children are giving birth to. I'm talking about a God that said in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit. And so I said, I don't want our young people coming into youth group saying, thank God I made it through another week. I want them coming into our youth group saying today I shouted the name of Jesus up and down the corridors of my school I got my Bible in my hand and I'm telling people everywhere I go that there is a God who's bigger than any God in this world can somebody say hallelujah your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy The devil would have you think that that doesn't mean you. Well, you know, I'm sure there's a kid out there whom God's going to use. Let it be your kid. Let it be your little boy. Let it be your little girl. Let it be your grandbabies. Hallelujah. He said, I don't have any. You'll get them one day. Pray over them now. That's the promise of God. It shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. It's not a question of that, it, that incites doubt in the heart of the believer. It's a promise from God. It shall come to pass. God is going to do what he said he would do. And he said, it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh Everybody on the earth is going to have an opportunity to experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. The worst person you can think of this morning is going to be given an opportunity to experience God. And God said it's so powerful that I'm going to pour it out on your sons and your daughters, they're going to prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. So anybody that's got some gray hair, don't you think your day is done? Don't you sit on the sidelines and say, well, I'll leave it up to the younger people. This is not the time for you to back off. This is time for you to engage and lock in. Come on, somebody. Lock in with God. Lock into the church. Lock into revival. Lock into the book of Acts because God said your old men are going to dream dreams. And why would God give an old man a dream? Because there's still something for you to do for the kingdom of God. He says in the last days, the last days, not just Pentecost in Jerusalem, but in the last days, God said, I'm going to pour out my spirit. There's not a generation that will ever be exempt from the power of the Holy Spirit. There's not a people that will never be given an opportunity. And we may be the last generation in this world, I don't know. But the Bible says your sons and your daughters are going to be included. Therefore, there is no question that every demonic power in hell that is going after your children, going after you, going after your family, going after your finances, going after your marriage. Every demonic power in hell is defeatable. Hallelujah. If you will just live as God said, according to the power of the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? Amen. So the church in the book of Acts is the church that you're sitting in today. This is the church exploding with signs and wonders and miracles. People walk to the altar and get healed here. I'm not a healer. God's a healer. But if you'll listen to God and walk to the altar, you'll get healed. Amen. 
I, I was really wrestling this morning singing those songs. I mean, I was blessed. But if they put the words up right now, you know, some of the words in that song make half of us hypocrites. Because many, many Christians are gripped in fear today. Fear of plagues and viruses and the average church in America, the average church in America is absent of signs and wonders and miracles. What you see here, and I am not boasting, I'm not bragging, I'm, I'm not uh, wanting to be egotistical or arrogant, but what you see here, you will not see everywhere else. Some of you have gotten used to it and it's just kind of become the norm. Well, take a trip. Go around a little bit. Go sit in some dead mausoleum on a Sunday morning and you'll better understand what I'm talking about. All the glory goes to God, but I want you to understand it's either do or die. It's either all God or none at all. It's either run after this thing with everything you've got or you might as well sit down and go the way of the weary. It's time that we understood that there's something beginning in this place. Altars are filled. Miracles are happening. And God is confirming his word with signs and wonders and miracles and you know what makes it happen even more when you shout it on a little bit when you get behind it when you say yeah hey give it a uh -huh, hallelujah the average church doesn't see it they're absent of the demonstration of God and you're just going to have to take my word for it there's very few that are seeing God manifest in the supernatural. No signs, no wonders, and no miracles. And it's no wonder. It's no wonder, and I'll tell you why. Because half of our seminaries and half of our once called Bible colleges are now institutions of higher learning that they call liberal arts. Our Bible colleges, for the most part in America, have become as secular as any other secular university. They do not teach what needs to be taught from the word of God. Can I get an amen from some Pentecostal here? Bible schools have closed. Major denominations have shut their schools down. And I'm going to tell you why. They've shut them down because our pulpits for the last half of a generation or more have not preached the call of God into young people's lives. They have not told people about the mighty moving of the Holy Ghost. They have not demonstrated and seen the demonstration of God moving by signs and wonders and miracles. And so young people today that, that, that could have had a call on their life to preach the gospel decided that they would go to the first year of the course and, and you know, get a little Bible training, but then look for a career. I'm, I'm glad I chose the will of God for my life. And I'm not telling you that we don't need great doctors and great nurses and great, great lawyers and great people out there in the business world. We need men and women of God in the business world. But where are the preachers up to? today we've got people that are stimulating the minds of young men but they're not touching the heart of people we've got lectures but we don't have demonstration we have ceremonies and creeds and rituals but we don't have people getting set free by the power of God I'm preaching better than you're shouting this morning but it's true preachers are a product of the colleges and the seminaries when I went to Bible school, I learned faith. I went to where I went because I knew I had a call to preach the gospel and I needed to go there. If you're, if you're going to be a lawyer, you don't go to, uh, to, go to Mar uh, Martha Stewart's baking school, college. You go to law school. Our youth and our children, our young adults, your young adults right in this church will only rise to the level of demonstration and faith that they're getting fed here. And if we become a, a weak and a mamby-pamby type of a church that's spoon-feeding our babies and our children some, some uh, what we call pablum in Canada, but you call it whatever down here, and we're spoon-feeding them, how, do, how are we going to expect them to gnaw on a T-bone steak when they get a little bit older in the Holy Ghost? How are we going to expect these young people
people to rise up and cast out devils and speak in new tongues and, 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 and do what the Bible said they'll be able to do. Your children need the baptism in the Holy Ghost. We're raising, we're raising, we're raising them up here for that. But a generation must not go without a demonstration. There must be a demonstration. There must be more than just church. There has to be something where people's lives are changed and healed and set free forever. And in Acts chapter 1, the Bible talks about that. The book of Acts comes on the scene like an explosion. The book of Acts opens literally like it's, like it's just a catapulting into the realm of a dimension many do not even know. Cities were shaken. Lives were changed. The Holy Ghost moved. The Spirit of God moved. And as you read through the book of Acts, you will see blind eyes open, lame legs walk, deaf ears heard. 28 chapters. 28 chapters filled with supernatural <coughs> signs, wonders, miracles. They never said the church was a Baptist church, or Presbyterian church, or Pentecostal church, Catholic church, or Anglican. They said it was a church. I'm so glad we never put a, a name a denomination on the sign for fear that someone may drive by and not feel welcome because they don't wear the same denominational badge that others do but over the years and over the centuries men got in the way good men who were led astray thought that they would come in with the plans of men Stay with me for just a few moments, please. They introduced the segregation of doc, denomination, denominationalism. Segregation is simply a word of separation. Denominationalism. It's not all bad, but it's not all good. And men began to divide up into different denominational titles. And then they would take the title that they had, the Wesleyans, the Baptists, the Purists, the Methodists, the Pentecostals. And we would devise our interpretation of what the Bible says. And somewhere along the line, the minds of men began to scribe their ideologies, their interpretations of Scripture. Legalism introduced itself and turned many people off of God altogether. Created an elitist mentality. When Jesus said the doors are open, whosoever will may come. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that Jesus is no respecter of persons? He doesn't look at your social economic status. He doesn't care about the color of your skin. He doesn't care if you're a boy or a girl, a man or a woman. The Bible says whosoever will may come. But over 19 centuries, 20 now, have come and gone. All kinds of doctrinal, dogmatic statements have been in, written and interpreted by men. And the stream of God, the river of the Holy Ghost found in the book of Acts. This, this crystal clear river of supernatural power. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about this morning. Maybe you're new to this thing and you don't understand, but I'm telling you about a God who doesn't care whether you got a three-piece suit on or a Budweiser t-shirt and a pair of cut-off shorts. I'm talking about a God this morning who loves you just the way you are, who doesn't care about the outside, he cares about the inside. I'm talking about a God who 
who's quite disturbed today that we have made this thing about the outward appearance but God is not impressed with our majestic cathedrals and God is not impressed with our technology God looks down through his Holy Spirit today who's the active moving force of God God the Holy Spirit is not an agent of God God the Holy Spirit is God the presence of God is in this room today the presence of God is going through our cameras today the power of God is manifesting in this house today but men men has muddied the waters with our doctrinal determinations throwing our two cents in and God said I didn't need it didn't need it didn't need to hear your opinion I just need you to read the book but I looked in that river that crystal river of signs and wonders and miracles I drank of the water of it I've seen it flow down the stream I've watched as men have muddied it even in my generation and I determined I'm not drinking it from downstream. I'm going upstream. I'm going before the pollutants got in. I'm going before it was stagnated and staunched and stank and, and all the putricity that was put into it by the opinions of men over the generations. I've decided I'm not drinking that water anymore. I've decided I'm going upstream to the beginning of the source. I'm going to the very source of the river. I'm going where the water is pure, where the miracles flow, where the power of God is demonstrated. I'm going back to the beginning, back to the book of Acts where God said in the last days I'm going to pour out my spirit God's looking for a church that has experienced that mighty shaking how you could stay the same when you leave this room will boggle my mind how we could continue with anything less than what God has given us. Signs, wonders, and miracles. I wish I had more time. Judges chapter 6. The Bible tells the story of a man by the name of Gideon. It doesn't tell us anything about his stature. So I'm going to guess he was kind of small. And you can say whatever you want. You might think he was big, but there's no evidence either way. So I'll just say. Gideon is the man you know that God gave a plan. And he said, here's how you're going to defeat the enemy. And so in Judges chapter 6, verse 12 and verse 13... Israel's in great distress. The enemy's in the camp. The church is in great distress today. The church is in distress. The church. Most have lost their sight of God. Most are putting... No, I can't go there. I don't have time. Putting their faith, their hope, in a vaccine. How can we sing those songs? Now, if you got it, you got it. If you don't, you don't. I don't care. I don't care. I really don't care. But if you haven't got it, let me tell you this. That there's still a God in Israel. There's still a God who's never changed. There's still a God who will keep you from it, keep you in it, and he'll get you through it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. an hour on just that Bible says God said to Gideon go and redeem the people of Israel out of the hand of the enemy go and redeem them where's our preachers who are redeeming the people half our preachers today are more concerned that if they preach the wrong thing they'll lose the Mr. Big Bucks from coming to their church and won't be able to get their paycheck and pay the mortgage next month are you with me this morning
I don't know how God's going to do it, but I know he's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to provide, but I know he's going to provide. I'm telling you, there's getting ready to become a supernatural release of, of, of favor upon the house, this house, Great Life Church, that God it says the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. Amen. That there's coming a transfer, a divine transfer of great wealth into the hands of godly people. I'm not talking $10. I'm talking millions and millions and millions of dollars. I just want you to know, get ready. It's part of the end time prophetic word of God. I'm not opposed to building funds and all that stuff, but I just want to give God an opportunity. Amen. Well, we've been saving for 36 years. Haven't won a soul yet, but, but at least we got $900,000 in our building fund. Well, who gives a rip? You just get 900000 The building that once was $4 million is now $19 million. What are you going to do with that? Someone told me the other day a sheet of plywood has gone up from like $29 or $30 to $80 or $90. What are you going to do? Who's determining this thing? That's why we got to come back to trusting in God and relying on God. And God says to to Gideon, go and redeem the people of Israel out of the hand of the enemy. And God says, I'm with you, thou mighty man of valor. Can I remind you this morning that God, who's no respecter of persons, says you're no different than Gideon. And God says, I'm with you. Go and do what I put in your heart. All that is in thy heart to do, go and do it. And you know what Gideon said? Listen to what Gideon said. He said, if God is with us, where are all his miracles? Where are the miracles of God? Church is not church because I preach. It's not church because we sing. We've not had church until we've seen a demonstration. You're in a church that I don't even have a desire to go on another day if we don't see a demonstration. If my gift won't make it anywhere in the world, it certainly won't make it here. And so we God do it, do something so big here. Give us a demonstration. Not just the logos, not just the preaching, not just the announcements, not just the, the you know the service. I want to see cancer tumors fall off and die. I want, I want to see ears pop open. I want to see blind eyes open. Thank God for cataract surgery, but why don't you try God beforehand? Let me lay my hands on your troubled eyes and let God heal you.